Good morning. Go ahead and grab your Bible and uh, you can join me in 1 John chapter 4. We are a week away from Christmas Eve uh, and then Christmas Day and I hope that you've been able to celebrate the, the season already in numerous ways. We've had a full week this uh, past week at West Jackson, uh, even with last Sunday night, our um, music ministry and uh, Pastor Steve and so many that are involved there uh, did a fantastic job, our choir and musicians and leading us in worship. And then Monday night, we were able to gather in here and we were able to have the Heartland Christmas party and we were able to see eight uh, different uh, kids, students uh, be baptized to profess their faith in Jesus Christ. And we can celebrate that. That was a phenomenal thing to be a part of. And so thankful for those who lead out in that ministry as well. And then uh, Wednesday night, we had about 600 or so, 700 uh, people from our community gathered here and had the ultimate Christmas party and were able to share the gospel with them. And we're still following up on the decisions that were made as a part of that. And, and even Friday night, um, uh, some of you were able to lead in our room in the end ministry and were able to house some of the homeless men in our uh, community and uh, to share a meal with them, uh, to love on them. And so it's been a great week. And, uh, and I'm excited about the week to come. And just want to remind you of the opportunity we have this next Sunday, um, December 24th, will be a little bit unique in the fact that we will have worship at 1030 in here. Um, next Sunday, we will not have community groups. And all this is in your weekly that you got when you received, when you walked in. It's also on the app if you want to look at it there. But next Sunday morning, we will not have community groups, but we will have worship at 1030. And then we'll have a Christmas Eve service that evening. The live nativity starts at 430. And then our Christmas Eve service will start at five o'clock. It's uh, typically about 45 minutes. There's no childcare for that. So we try to make it shorter for some of you parents. And we know there are other family traditions that you have on Christmas Eve. Uh, but our Christmas Eve service will be unique uh, from uh, the, the Sunday morning service. It'll be different. It won't be the same service. Uh, Sunday morning will be a normal type worship time like we'd have this morning. Christmas Eve, we'll all gather in here. There'll be, a, we'll have a candlelight and uh, sing Silent Night. And it's just a, an incredible time. And, and it's an opportunity for you to invite uh, uh, someone who might no normally go to church. Um, a lot of churches are kind of just doing one service and that's it. But we think Christmas Eve is a valuable opportunity for you to invite a neighbor or just a, a, maybe a relative that you're having in town, may not be a believer. And so we look forward to that time gathering with you and celebrating Christmas. And once again, it'll be about a 45 minute service. And we are going to focus on 1 John chapter four, like we are, like we have been the past few weeks. And we're, we're gonna be talking about um, the love of God, the implications of God's love. And there are many attributes of, of God that we can mention and celebrate. God is, uh, he's powerful, he's righteous, he's just, but the, uh, and all of these are, are weighty and they're true. They are for our good and for his glory. But ultimately, I think the hope of Christmas is about God's love and our confidence in the face of a God who is all powerful and a God who is righteous, and a God who is just. Our confidence in the face of that kind of God is the fact that He is also love, that He loves us. And His love, once again, it can change our hearts. It can lead us to love others in the most profound ways. And, you know, one of the things I've heard over the past few weeks, at least in my own home, well, it just, you know, it just doesn't feel like Christmas yet. It just doesn't feel like Christmas yet. And there's a number of things we try to do to get the, the Christmas feelings going. We put the tree up, we decorate the house, we have Christmas programs, we watch Hallmark movies. There's lots of things that we engage in and all those are good things. But if we're not careful, we can wait for the Christmas feeling, this mysterious thing to come on us and kind of make, give us this warm uh, feeling inside. And that's what we say, you know, the, that, that's the Christmas feeling. And, and there's nothing wrong with those things. All those things are good things. But the Christmas feelings come, my friends, when we enter the story of Christmas. And there are some real practical ways, if you're not there yet, that you can get there. And John's going to point, us, uh, point to us the way this morning in 1 John chapter 4. So let's read here, starting in verse 16. 
Um, The second part of verse 16 says this, God is love and the one who remains in love remains in God and God remains in him. In this, love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. We love, for, we love because he loved us first. If anyone says, I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he is, who has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. Let's pray together. Father, what a privilege it is to gather in this place with other believers, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And what an opportunity for us uh, to not only sit and hear your word, to read your word, to pray and sing together, but also to live it out uh, with each other, Father, that we would truly be the family of God, your children, Lord, specifically in the way that we love each other. So would you help us to have teachable hearts this morning? Uh, Father, may we look more like Jesus at the end of our time together, and we pray these things in his name. Amen. Well, in just a few days, um, the, parent, the, the patience of parents, of all parents everywhere, will be tested in the assembly of toy cars and trampolines and play sets and all those need to be assembled gifts with the, with the vague instructions, you know, and the poorly crafted uh, parts. You know, as you uh, sit there on Christmas Eve or maybe after Christmas, Christmas Day, and you're trying to put those things together, it's not easy. And I think if you're a handy person and you wanted to make some extra cash at Christmas, you could be on call Christmas Eve. And, and you can make... You could name your price if you were on call Christmas Eve to come in and and put together some Christmas toys. Uh, For me, the PTSD comes from a kid's kitchen. I remember it six or seven years ago and just opening the box and and I felt like there must have been a thousand pieces. And in this kid's kitchen, it included a stovetop, an oven, a sink, a microwave, a refrigerator, shelf space, on and on. And basically, they were asking me to renovate an entire kitchen. That's what they were asking me to do in, in, in the course of, of an evening. And the expectations are unreal, aren't they? Uh, and so my strategy when putting something together, I'm not a proud man. And so I read the instructions. I try to follow the instructions carefully. And then not only that, but I put the picture of the completed item, what it should look like in front of me. And so as I'm following the instructions, Hopefully, right, as I put this thing together, that it will resemble what's on the box. Now, there was a few years ago when we got a treadmill, and I remember putting it together, I had everything, and then I thought the last part was to set the actual, you know, the computerized part where you control everything. And I remember trying to put it on there, it didn't fit. And then I realized that if I turned it around backwards, it would go on that way. And so, in order to actually control the treadmill, you would have to be on the other side of it, not actually on it. And so I had to take everything off and, and reassemble it again. Um, but typically I have the picture right there in front of me. I'm looking at the picture and as I put this thing together following the instructions, my confidence grows as the pieces come together, right? It, it's, confidence is gained as the parts begin to resemble the finished product on the box, the completed design. And I think this is what John is getting at here in his letter. In this part of his letter in chapter 4, he's saying, we have seen, earlier last week, he said, we have seen um, God's love on display in the coming of Jesus. Jesus was sent out, right, because God loved us. He looked down and he loved us. There was nothing in us that warranted him to love us. He just chose to set his love upon us. And then he sent his son and his son lived a life of love and he died out of love, laying down his life so that we might be saved from our sins and rescued from death. This is the picture of love 
that we have, right? We see the finished work of Jesus' love. And for those who, who have trusted in Jesus, if that's you this morning, through the power of the Holy Spirit in you, His life-changing love is now at work in you and through you. And God's love has an agenda in you. God's love, when it comes and rests upon you, when you begin to realize God's love and experience it in your life, it's just not meant for you to experience, right? Christmas is not you just sitting here basking in the warmth that, the, of the love that God has for you. No, God's love has a purpose in you. And its intended purpose, right, it, it, it's perfected, right? It's mature. This is a word that um, John uses over and over again in his letter. He, his goal for you as a Christian is to be perfect. And when he says perfect, he doesn't mean without blemish or without fault. No, he's saying finished. He's saying mature. That God's love, his purpose for his love in you is to reach this intended purpose that you would love your brothers and sisters in Christ in the way that he has loved you. Christian maturity, listen, because we, we get this confused all the time. Christian maturity is not a matter of age. It's not a matter of how old you are. You can be young and you can be mature, you can be old and you can be very immature with Christian maturity. Christian maturity is not a matter of knowledge. It's not about how much you know. In fact, what's terrible uh, is, is sometimes who know, is someone who knows a good deal of information about the Bible, but they have no love in their heart. That's a bad combination. No, Christian maturity is not about knowledge. It's not a measure of one's knowledge. It's also not even a measure of one's activity, Christian activity. There are a lot of people that can serve the church over and over again, but it's not out of love. It's just a bunch of activity. God's love in you is matured when you love like Jesus. Christian maturity ultimately is a matter of, about, of love. And, and certainly love does lead to knowledge. Love does lead to serving one another. But his maturity, your maturity in Christ is a matter of you living and loving like Jesus. When we love like Jesus, when this happens in our life, look at what happens in verse 17. He says that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Now, what does that mean? When we begin to look at our lives, we begin to love like Jesus, that we can have confidence in the day of judgment. Now, this is not the first time that John mentions this idea of judgment. Earlier in chapter 2, he talks about the day that when having confidence, when, when Jesus returns, when Jesus comes back, when Jesus comes back, we will uh, at some point stand before God, right, in judgment. And Jesus is the appointed judge. So what does it mean that we have confidence? Well, I don't think what John is saying here is that obedience to the command of God to love one another somehow merits righteousness for us. We need to be careful that we don't begin to think through this verse that all of a sudden that, well, if I love others well, the more I love others, the, the more God will love me. We don't need to begin to think that somehow we earn our standing based upon the work of love. That's not what John is, is saying here. I believe what he's saying here is our obedience does not change God's disposition towards us, but it can change our confidence before him. Our, our love for others, right, and our, our obedience does not change God's disposition for, uh, uh, towards us. God, if you're a believer in Christ, God's disposition, His temperament towards you is settled in the finished work of Christ, right? Ephesians 1 tells us that we are holy and blameless in God's sight, that He has set His love on you before the foundation of the world. And so, God's God's feelings towards you don't go up and down each day based upon your performance. And that is, that is such good news for me, I, I tell you, because I feel so up and down in my struggles in life, with my struggles, with my own personal sin. Man, it can feel like a roller coaster. And my hope in that is God has set his love on me in the person of Christ, and it does not change based upon my performance. But our confidence before God can change. 
And once again, it's not because we can look back and say, God, look what I've done. I've got standing now. It's no, that's not what John is saying. In fact, he's saying something completely different. And we're going to go on to see that. He says, as we love one another, as Jesus has loved us, we are identifying more and more with the person of Jesus. So that, he's, he's starting to take us to, to what he, he means by this, what, what, that, what that statement means, that our confidence grows as we, as we think about judgment, our confidence grows because we love one another. Why is that? Well, we're because we're becoming more and more like Jesus. In other words, as we begin to live out this love that he has first loved us with, we are slowly, our lives are slowly becoming to look more and more like the picture on the box, the finished and completed, right? love of Christ that we have seen, our lives are more and more looking like that. In fact, these are, these are the words of Jesus to his own disciples that he's going, people are going to associate us with him based upon the way that we love one another. And the specific love he's talking about is the love that one Christian has for another Christian that you have for another person in the body of Christ, in the family of God. In John chapter 13, that's a a pretty well-known chapter in the Bible. It's the the chapter of the night before Jesus, the night Jesus was going to be arrested. He's gathered there with his disciples in the upper room and he pushes back from the table and he washes the disciples' feet. If you've been in church for a while, uh, you're familiar with that story. If if that's new to you, it's it's incredible because Jesus was was pushing back from the table, pushing back from the meal. It had already been served, and he, he takes the form of a servant. He takes the position of a servant and goes around and washes the disciples' feet. And it blew them away. They couldn't believe their master Jesus would do this for them. And Jesus goes on to say these words in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. He says, I give you a new command, love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Underline that verse if you have it open. Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another one another. Now, once again, most of us hear these words and we, we think that those, that statement by Jesus is familiar to you. And we don't necessarily, we, we can read those words and just skim over them and think, well, yeah, I, I can do that. I've got that. But my friends, those are some of the most challenging words in the Bible. I mean, we should be humbled as we read these words. Too often we can read them and not necessarily feel moved by them. But just think about the culture that we live in. This is completely contrary to the culture that we, that we live in. It, it, it's okay in, in our culture to be nice people. Right? That's, that's, that's part of what we are to be. Those, every, we, we assume we want everybody to be nice people. But Jesus, the, the tone he is setting here, right? Is, is more than just being nice. This is a, uh, a giving up your rights. This is a uncomfortable, inconvenient kind of love that Jesus is displaying for his disciples. And he's calling us to take on ourselves. He's washing the feet of his disciples. He's, he's being a, a servant to his brothers in Christ even to the one who's pretending to be his brother, right? At this point in time, when Jesus washed his feet, Judas is still in the room, and yet Jesus even washes his feet. Too often, we don't see the radical nature of the love of Jesus. Christmas is cute. The baby in the manger. It's, it's such a warm thing, right, to observe and to celebrate. But my friends, it's, it's beyond just warm and cute. It is radical. Like in, in the most profound way that God has loved you and me. It is extreme. Have you ever seen someone like love someone else in such an extreme way where it almost made you feel uncomfortable? That's what Jesus has done for you. That's what Jesus has done for me. He set aside what was rightfully his. And this kind of love is is counter to our culture when everyone is demanding 
their own rights. Jesus says love is just the opposite. It's not demanding your rights. It's, it's surrendering them. It's, it's giving them up. That's an upside down kind of love, right? When you love your brothers and sisters in Christ this way, it's going to feel unnatural. It's going to feel upside down. But, but Jesus is saying, when you do this, you're resembling Jesus. Once again, look what he says. When you love like this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Why? Because this kind of love is so unique. The culture can't look at it and just say, well, that's nice. They're kind. No, they'll look at it and think, wow, there is something completely different about the kind of love that, that Christians have one for another inside the church. And, and they, when they see it, they should, should, they, should be, they should almost stumble over it because it's so extraordinary. And what John is saying, when we begin to love each other in that way, on the day of judgment, it will be an identifying mark for you. That you'll be able to see this love in you, and as you stand before God and you stand before Jesus, you'll see this kind of love from you can only come from Him. And it will give you confidence. Um, If you have the opportunity to go to uh, help our church partnership in Guatemala, it's an incredible trip. I've been a a few times, and um, there's always a little bit of culture shock. Uh, whenever you go to another country, um, I say this, even when we go visit Ellen's relatives in Louisiana, there's always a little bit of culture shock that you step into. And uh, you fly over to Guatemala, you land in Guatemala City, and you get off the airplane, and immediately you're just surrounded by Guatemalans, and they just look different, they sound different, it's, but it's, it, everything's busy and moving around, and you can't understand the language. And when you walk out of the airport, you walk onto the street, and there's, you know, several hundred Guatemalans just staring at you. They're all waiting for someone else to get off the airplane they're looking for, but because you're 6'3", and you're an American, right, you step off, and, and they're just automatically going to start looking at you and looking at the group that you're with. And, and once again, it, there's a little bit of culture shock there. But in that moment, I tell you, I remember the first time I went, kind of scanning across the, the crowd, we were looking for someone who was there to pick us up, this young man named Mephi. And Mephi did something very, very wise, I was thankful for. He actually had a West Jackson t-shirt on. Uh, the group that had been there before uh, left him a West, gave him a West Jackson t-shirt. And amidst all this confusion, right, I look over there and there's Mephi, this, this short little Guatemalan guy, and he has a West Jackson Baptist Church t-shirt on. And as soon as we see him, we're like, you, right? You are our guy, right? He identified with us in that moment. And because he chose to do that, like we, we gained a little bit of confidence in that moment. And I think that's what ultimately John is leading us to, 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 to see here when we choose to love like Jesus, when his love begins to work in our lives and reach its intended purpose to love other people, it's so unique, it's so different that when we stand before Jesus one day, right, which is going to be, uh, uh, D.A. Carson calls this the ultimate culture shock. The day you stand before God will be the ultimate culture shock. When you see God face to face, it'll be, it'll be like standing in the presence of the Son. And in that moment, right, when you're, uh, nothing will be hidden. Everything will be turned upside down. But this upside down love he calls us to live out in this life, in that moment, will seem right side up. It will seem right. And that will give us confidence on that day when we stand before God, the judge. And I think as he goes on in verse 18, he's, he's somewhat saying the same thing. This is a very popular verse in Christendom. It says, there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. Uh, once again, I think he's, he's saying the same thing he's saying in verse 17, but he's saying it a different way. And when he says the perfect love drives out fear, he's not saying that a Christian should never have a, a healthy fear of God. He's not saying that at all. 
People take that verse out of context and, and, you know, all of a sudden if you have a healthy fear of God, all of a sudden you're, you don't really know God's love. You're not loving God like you should, should. You're applying it to all kinds of different areas of life. And here he's talking about specifically the day of judgment. He's saying that this, this love, right, once it's perfected in your life, it drives out the fear that we would have that one day we'll stand before God and that he would punish us. That he would, that he would condemn us. We do know, right, that we're to have a reverential fear for God, right? A healthy fear of God because it, all throughout Proverbs, it says the beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of the Lord. It's to recognize that God knows more than you do. It's to recognize that, that God is omniscient, omnipotent, right? All these things lead us to live wise lives. And so to say that we're not to have any kind of fear of the Lord, I think it goes beyond what John is saying here. He's saying, no, on the day of judgment, that right as we... As we allow God's love to work through us, it drives out this fear that we could have, right? This perfected love drives out fear. And once again, we, we should have a, 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 once again, a reverential fear for, for the Lord and the fact that He disciplines those He loves. But He's saying as the Lord's love is perfected in us, we don't fear punishment of the Lord because we can see his love working in us and it confirms the reality of his salvation that he has accomplished for us, right? As God's love works in us, we have come to know, right, the salvation that he has provided for us on our behalf because this is the beginning act of his love, right? This is how we come to know his love is through the gospel, um, and so in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 24, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sin, we might live for righteousness. So the way we come to know God's love initially, right, is him revealing to us the gospel, which is all about his love, that he would send his son to die on the cross for our sins. And so we know as we experience God's love that, that the punishment of God has been taken on our behalf. Jesus has taken our punishment. And so there's no condemnation. There's no punishment for the believer. There is discipline. A good, a good father will discipline those he loves, will discipline his children, but it's not meant as punishment, right? There's no punishment for those who have come to know Christ as Lord and Savior or have been adopted into the family of God and know God as Father. And so, we don't fear punishment because we know our punishment is taken care of. And that reality, that truth is, becomes more and more uh, dominant in our lives as his love completes its purpose in our lives, right? As his love blossoms in our lives. This is how God has loved us. In verse 19, he goes on to say, we love because he first loved us. In the same way that a, that a parent or a mother would hold her baby and she would smile at that baby. She's trying to elicit a smile back, right? How does a baby learn how to smile? Well, the baby sees his mom or dad or brother or sister holding that baby, smiling in the face of that baby. And as, as that baby sees someone smile at them, then they learn to smile back. In the same way God has loved us, he has smiled upon us, and we have come to know his love. And now, his love awakens a love in us for him. And our love for him, John would go on to say, will manifest itself in our love for his family. To the point that he will go on and say this, if you claim to love God and you hate your brother and, or sister, right? And this even means to hate them in, a, in, in your heart. In fact, I think that word hate, it, it kind of points towards that. It's not just an outward hate. Uh, not too many of us in the church, most of us know better than to outright hate someone else, right? We, we know that's not something that's appropriate in this context, but I would dare say there are probably some of us in the room that have hate in our heart towards someone else, to take pleasure in someone else's misfortune, to be happy when, when someone else goes through a trial, or to be 
you know, to be critical of them. You wouldn't say anything, but you're, you're always looking at them and what they're doing with, with critical eyes. You, you never assume the best. You always assume the worst. You, you always focus on their faults. And what John would say, if that's you, if you claim to love God and you have hate even in your heart towards another believer, John says, you're a liar. He says, you're a liar a few times in his letter here. One, he says, if you say you love God and you don't, or you know God and you don't obey his commands, you're a liar. Then it's more of a theological question. He says, if you say you love God, but you don't believe that he, Jesus is the son of God, come in the flesh, he says, then you're a liar. And here he says, if, right, in the same way, if, if, if you say you love God and yet you hold ill will to, or towards one of your brothers or sisters in Christ within the church, then you are a liar. You're not telling the truth. You're self-deceived because proof of love for the invisible God, he will say, is seen in our love of visible people. If you say you love God, right, and he's invisible, and yet you can't love people who are visible, then how do we know you really love God? How could you love God? No, as we love others, our love for the invisible God is made visible, John would say. As we love others, people who are made in God's image, people who are a part of the family of God, people that God sent his son, Jesus, to die for, as we love those people, right, love for the invisible God is made visible. I've told this story uh, before. It's been years, I think, since I've told it, and some of you are new, and the rest of you don't remember it. Um, I can tell you that. So, I remember the first time I met Ellen's family. Um, we were dating. I don't think we weren't engaged at the time, but driving over there, and she has an older sister, and her sister. Uh, I remember driving down the road, and she kind of knew, knew about her family, and. Um, uh, Southwest Louisiana is just different. Things are different down there anyway. And, uh, and so uh, her sister had uh, f- uh, four kids at the time, and they were all under the age of seven. Is that right? Six or seven. And uh, the youngest one was still in a diaper. He could walk around, but he was, he was in a diaper. And then the other one, the oldest was seven. There were you know, two in the middle. And when I grew up, I, did, I wasn't around small children. I wasn't around babies. Um, I, I didn't really know what to do with, with, with kids like that. I, was a, I have an older brother, but I was the youngest in the family. And so there's much more to this story, but I'll make it more brief f- for you. Um, I remember driving up and um, the, the first one, you know, they came out and greet you and everything. And they're, you know, kids just kind of love you and hug you. And, and once again, if you... If you're a college student and you've never been around kids, you know what I'm saying, but uh, just think, I mean, it's uncomfortable, right? Just have those kids cling you on your legs, you know, what do you do? And um, the, the little kid who was in the diaper, he was always just wet, like, <laughs> just like wet. And it was kind of a gooey, kind of saliva type wet, you know? And so if you picked him up and put him down, you were wet, you know, and it wouldn't, wouldn't come off. And... Um, I sat down on the couch and one of the kids jumped up in my lap and wanted me to like, you know, play with him. And I remember kind of letting him fall and he was putting his feet in my lap and I would let him fall to one side of the couch, the other side of the couch. And then eventually he fell too far on this side of the couch and hit his head on the edge of the couch. And um, so he started wailing and crying and, you know, telling his mom that I hurt him. And so that was a great, um, that was a great, you know, look for me as well. And then I remember we, we took them, you know, Ellen, Ellen was testing me here, I'm sure. And, uh, and so we took them to a, a restaurant, I don't remember what restaurant it was, and, um, you know, just us and, and the four kids, which was a really bad idea, Ellen. But um, <laughs> I remember the, the three or four-year-old, he said he had to go to the bathroom. And, uh, and of course, you know, I'm the only guy there. 
And I've never taken a kid to the bathroom before. I've never changed a diaper. He didn't have a diaper. I never changed a diaper. I was glad I didn't have to do that. But I remember walking into the bathroom and opening up, you know, first of all, I just said, okay, is it, is it number one or number two, you know? And I was praying, God, let this be number one. You know, please, God. And he said, number two, and, and not to be gross or anything. It's just helpful for, you know, see the predicament I was in. So it was number two. And so I remember opening up the stall door right? And the toilet is this round, right? This round. His bottom is like this. <laughs> and so honestly, I had no idea how this is supposed to play out. I really had no idea. And I just met this kid like the day before, right? And so we're sitting there and uh, so, you know, get ready, you know? And so he gets ready and the only thing I need to do is hold him. And I'm hovering him over the seat like this. And his legs are dangling on either side because I think if I let go, he's going to fall in. And so I'm, I'm hovering on the seat and, and I'm scared, he's scared. And eventually um, he looks at me and he goes, I don't have to go anymore. Uh, I think I scared him <laughs> to the point when I, I was like, secretly, I was like, thank you, Lord, you know, and we went back out and I guess he waited till he got home. But uh, you know, I remember through the course of that week, just discovering, you know, what it looked like and to, to be a part of her family and to over the, over the years, if you're married or you're dating someone seriously, you know what this looks like. But if I say that I love Ellen, then that means that I have to love those that she loves. And if I don't love those she loves, then it would be hard for me to convince her that I love her. Those two things go hand in hand. And so it is, John is saying with God's people. If you say you love God, then with that it means that you must love those whom God loves. And specifically he's speaking about the family of God. So what does that mean for us this Christmas? Two quick things. If you truly want to experience the love of God in your life this Christmas, these are those practical things, right, that you can do. You can watch all the Hallmark movies. You can listen to the Christmas music. You can go on and on and on. And the truth is, eventually, over time, you can become numb to those things. But if you truly want to step into the story of Christmas and experience the love of God this Christmas, then number one, let the love of God complete its intended work in you through loving others. The holidays is one of those times we can slip into the mindset that, that nobody loves me. Uh, we, we can get there, right? We can have that pity party that nobody loves me. We wait in expectation for others to show us love. But what John is saying to us this morning is this, is that God's love is experienced in us when we choose to take the initiative in loving others. When you don't sit back and, and wait to be loved, but you step out. We talked about this last week. And you are the first to love. You, you write the letter. You make the phone call. You engage in the conversation. You, you give the gift. You pray for the person. You, you serve them. You affirm them. You encourage them. You, you reach out to them. And, and these are not just, uh, not just the people that you're comfortable with, but, but step into the world where you're doing this for people that you are uncomfortable with, that, that it might be inconvenient for you right? That's closer to the heart of Jesus that we see in John chapter 13, that we see at Christmas that God would descend to a manger to put his life in the hands of of a teenage girl. That's, that's, That's the love of Jesus. And the closer you get to that and your love for others, the closer you will be to mirroring the love of God and experience God's love in your life, its intended purpose in your love, in your life for this Christmas. It's number one, let the love of God complete its intended work in you through loving others. Number two, let others show you the love of God by allowing yourself to be loved. If it's true that, that God's love, that our love for God is made visible in the way that we love other people, then loving other people in God's name is a way for for God to show other people his love through you. And 
many of you will be so busy serving and loving and, and you've got this wall built up in your life. You, you want to do everything for everybody else and, and that's okay, but uh, that can certainly be motivated by love, but it can also be motivated by pride. You can be so busy putting together the perfect Christmas, doing everything for everybody else, and it can be motivated by pride. And if you're not careful, if it's not well received, then you can become a martyr. No, maybe what you need to do this Christmas is to slow down. Let someone love you. Be open to to receiving help. To, to receive someone serving you. And once again, sometimes this means putting yourself out there. Sometimes this means, uh, right, often it requires a certain level of vulnerability, being willing to admit, right, that you don't have it all together, that you're in need for help, or maybe it's just for prayer. For some of you, you've been attending here for a long time, and you've You've never stepped into a community group. My friends, a community group is where you gather with other people and you, right, you experience, right, the, the, the joys of, of Christmas and you celebrate life together and you, you weep together, you laugh together, you encourage one another, you serve one another. All those things that we read in the Bible that we're to be doing for one another are lived out in those, in those smaller groups. And the way you can experience God's love this Christmas is not by doing all these things for other people, but by stepping into a group and allow others to love and to do for you. To be vulnerable, to allow others to to meet you in your need. And ultimately, that's where it all begins anyway, doesn't it? Because... Coming to know God isn't about you seeking Him. No, initially, it was about Him seeking you and meeting you in your need. And if you're someone who has trouble receiving love, then maybe you need to go back to the first time when you came to know Christ. Because once again, there at that moment, there was nothing you had to offer him. The only thing you could do is not, you, you couldn't give the gift. No, the only thing you could do is to receive it. And I would say for you this morning, if, listen, if you're here today and you're not a believer, you're not a Christian, that's, that's where Christianity begins, right? That's where a relationship with God begins. That's where feeling the, the weight of your sin lifted and being forgiven by God begins, it's not by walking out of here and making all these commitments to God, things you're going to do to God, it's to, it's to step back and realize what God has done for you. The beginning place of love is not you loving him, but remembering that he has loved you in the most profound way. And maybe this Christmas, what you need to do is to slow down and just, just take a few moments to remember that. To open up your Bible and just, just, just take it very personally that God has loved you. Let's pray together.